So when we talk about like me being like beta in the past, uh, yeah, I very much so. Give I, the guys a, a good one time in your life you simped. Oh, we'll one, simp. one time? Give it one, <laughs> one, one good time. time. Only one? It's the juice. Um, I mean, give as many as you want, but one good example of I, when, um, when you simped. I did, okay, so I've been getting laid regularly since I was 17 years old. So my first okay. girlfriend was almost 17. Um, and I think what, th- what Ruth throws guys off is like, I was very like, very much like a simp. I guess we would call it a simp today, right? Very much blue pill, beta, yeah. beta kind of guy. And I was still getting laid at 17 years old in 1985 or whatever, right? And guys today were like, oh man, I'll never have for, for me. Like they would rather sit in their mom's basement and jerk off to whatever. And, and I'm like, it's because you don't, it's a different time. You're not getting out there and you're not motivated. You have no incentive to go and like cruise Main Street for chicks, right? Mm-hmm. Which is what we had to do. You had to actually go out and do stuff. Aaron Clary would be a great one to have and you know, have this conversation. Oh, he's coming before. next. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Aaron, like Aaron will tell you, and I'll tell you, is that the, in those days you had to actually go out and be in that sexual zone. So you had to go, um, and to go where the girls are. That's why I got in a band, man. It's yeah. like, so that's what Billy Joel um, said. That's what every guy did, you know, once because they want to get laid. It's yeah. not, but trust me, it certainly wasn't about the money back. Then. We noticed it when we did a show. We did a show, and then the, this band was on on the same show as us, and uh, the whole crowd was all bitches. I was like, dude, we got to get in a band. Dude. Well, yeah, Billy Joel said before he discovered the love of music, he was just like, I bet if I play music, I can, I can get women. Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But, I, remember, uh, I can remember being 14 years old, and I had uh, I was in ROTC. You know, ROTC is no. It was a uh, re. Reserve Officers Training Corps or something. It's okay. like with yeah, the, yeah. the military. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's uh. the, the Navy, the Army. It's in high school. I don't know if it's, maybe it still is. It's, is ROT still, still in high it's school? It's got to be. But there's, it was it Naval. Is, is yeah. it ROTC? Yeah. Because yeah, so in, in high school, there's like, it's sort of like preps guys who are like, hey, I'm, as soon as I get out of high school, I'm going to join the, the military. I'm going to join the Navy or join the Army or whatever. I was doing that right up until I was about mm, 14 and a half, maybe 15. And then I, all it took was like one girl goes, I really like guys with long hair. That was it. I'm out. Oh, <laughs> I think those, are, out, those recruiters, though, they yeah. prey on troubled kids. They'd be like, this yeah. is your Wait, ticket. Did you grew your hair out for a girl? I grew, no, no, I grew out not for a particular girl, but because I thought yeah, that women, girls yeah. like guys with long hair. And I'm like, well, f- why, well, of course they do, right? Def Leppard, right? Iron yeah, Maiden. Yes, sir. Uh, whoever, except for Phil Collins, because he did not have long hair. He had short hair. He did. So he was not one of those he on the did. Like on. the pyromania days. Uh, 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 Who was the one before Phil? It was Steve. Pete Willis. Pete Willis. Oh, no, Pete, Pete Willis. Willis. Yeah. That's the era that guys like Rolo like is mm-hmm. when Pete Willis was still in the band. When when John Rutsey was still in Rush. Yeah. Yep. Shit like that. Pete, but Pete, tell, Pete, all right, so anyway, so tell us one goofy thing you did to impress a girl in your young days. To impress a girl. God, there's so many. It's like it's it, it, it's almost like this. Okay, so when I was in high school, I hate, I hate giving these stories. You know why I hate giving these stories? Because what will happen is somebody will take a 30-second clip of this. <laughs> like, Rolo's a simp. He's a no, simp no, exposed. No, no. no they'll, go, they'll go, that's why he is the way he is. <laughs> um, because uh, because you, you had this one, you know, Susie McGillicuddy, uh, you know, at the homecoming dance blew you out. And so, therefore, that's what turned you into the life of misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> No, there was no no moment like that. I um I think probably the worst thing I ever did is I moved from uh, Southern California to and I won't say where, but I moved from one place to another just to facilitate my first girlfriend. Mm. Can you say how far the distance was? Uh, about three hundred miles. Damn, something like that. It was in California, Southern California to Northern California. Let's just say that. And um, and this was back in like nineteen eighty eight. Mm-hmm. And I had a good. T- and don't get me wrong, the experience was great <clears throat> to to go to get out and finally. I was like nineteen years old when yeah. I did it. Um, so it was good to sort of live on my own terms at that point, but like, <laughs> that's a pretty fucked up experience during that. And it was all because it was all prompted because I thought I was going to be able to facilitate the relationship with my first girlfriend, and I had to go there like I think about a month before um, before she got there because she was going to go to college there. She had gone. She was already ready to go to college. I'm like, I don't care. I don't. I wasn't like college bound or anything like that. And so I picked up and I moved and with like just like the clothes on my back and a guitar and an amp and that was all I had and um, didn't know anybody there just sort of tried to establish myself in this place because I was like that like I was so one eyed a soulmate I, I was totally on board with the soulmate myth right right then too 
And I thought, I thought, well, you know, we had sex, so she really loves me. And this must be the one, and we're going to have something, you know, special, and she'll be my high school sweetheart and everything. And so within the, the four weeks that we were apart from, like, me going up there and waiting on her, she, like, was already cheating on me. And she'd already got me with other dudes. <laughs> wow. It was, like, game on for her. And it's like, and so that was, a, I mean, that was definitely a beta blue pill moment in my life. But I learned a valuable lesson from that. In fact, a lot of that will, uh, you want to talk about stuff that applies from your, your past to where you are right now. Well, that was definitely an experience that I learned from. Uh, when I did the, the second book, uh, Preventive Medicine, and I was doing the timeline in there, like what you can expect from women at uh, different stages of, or different phases of their maturity, I, uh, I included like right around, I think it was like 17 to 19 is what, the, what I call the break phase. Mm-hmm. Because that's when guys kind of like grow up a little bit. Either they do or they don't. But that's, that's a very important phase in most young men's lives uh, at that point. Because if you're in a relationship or you got a girlfriend at that point, you'll fucking do anything for that chick. Mm-hmm. And here, I'll, I'll tell you how I know that too. Because I saw this, um, maybe you saw this too. There's this guy and he has a sports podcast. And I just saw the clip of this, and I don't know who the guy actually is, but he um, he was talking about how college like football recruiters will try. You know, they're they're trying to recruit the guys, the best guys from the high schools. And where where are you going to go to, Johnny? Are you going to go to Stanford? Or are you going to go to Ohio mm-hmm. State? Or where are you going to go to like? Because we want we need your talent on this team, right? So if you're a hot quarterback, or you're like a good running back, or you look like maybe you can play college football, yep. they want to recruit you, give you a full ride and scholarship and everything else, right? So, and it doesn't and it's all sports it's not just net you know football but yeah, that's what sport. i'm just going with so the guy was talking about this he, he went he went and he tracked like the top 10 uh potential college athletes that were going into college and they're selecting colleges mm-hmm. right and ev- in every situation in every one of those 10 the the guy who they wanted to recruit the player they wanted to recruit went to the college that his girlfriend at the time was going to so they will get offered. The guy would get an offer at like Stanford and yeah. like full ride scholarship. Play for Stanford. We really need you there. He goes to Ohio State because the girlfriend is going to Ohio State. So you know what they do now? You know what recruiters do now? What? They, they recruit roll and they the get, girlfriend. They recruit the girlfriend. I saw that. Okay, yeah. now they I know. Recruit yeah. the girlfriend. I did see that. That's how fucking predictable it is. That's no good business. Shit. Yeah, it is. So they'll now wow. they got because to them it's just all well. All, what's a, what's another scholarship? It's Susie, would you like to go to Stanford? Oh, Especially yeah. if that dude's yeah. gonna come in Bam. and sell a fuck ton what, of tickets. You knew you knew about that? Yeah, I just heard mm-hmm. about that story. I didn't hear it through the podcast, but I heard someone relaying the same story. And how they and so real quick, can I ask? Wait, wait. How old? Real quick. How old were you when you said that girl cheated on you? Uh, it was like 17, eight, 18, 19, 19. And, and so how much later was it in life after that when you learned why women cheat and how women cheat? Oh, man. Um, was it like years later? When, no, no, when did no, it start no, no, no. clicking that was, for you? That was it for I me, think, honestly. I think, <laughs> I, no, I think, you know, um, a lot of people are familiar with, with the, the topics that you get on on most podcasts. I think a lot of people are curious, though, like when exactly everything started clicking for you and how it clicked mm-hmm. for you. And the reason people wonder is because you grew up in the post-internet age. We're in the internet age mm-hmm. where we find a Rolo Tomasi to learn these things. So everybody kind of wants to know if you can pinpoint it the best you can mm-hmm. when things started clicking for you and why people ask me that all the time they say when was your red when did you get red pill yeah. yeah what's your what, when was your like a, like it's a verb right yeah, yeah really try uh, to think back so i it was um it, it's not any one moment that's just it it was like a series of oh, things really? yeah yeah it's so click. like that was definitely one of them so uh pr- right after that i'm like after i broke up i tried to make things work i tried to do the long distance relationship thing for a little while and then i'm like fuck God, either, what am i doing here you mm-hmm. know so, I, because I I didn't want to be where I was, I wanted to be back in Southern California, right? I wanted to be like in a band. I wanted to be doing my own thing. So that's what I did. Is I picked up and I moved back to Southern Cal, and um, and that's when I started playing in the Hollywood metal scene, right? And that sort of that experience, like, well, you know, she's yeah, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And then I'll tell you the other thing that taught you. Well, here's another phase, another phase of my Red Pill Awakening is once I started playing in the metal scene, I finally got into a band that was a good band and we were out play, regularly playing and I was getting laid like every other weekend, if not every weekend, depending on what the, what the gigs were. We had some, but mostly it was just like girls who happened to be at like the Roxy or Troubadour or, oh, okay. or the Central or <clears throat> Gazaris was fucking, Gazaris was a promised land when it was, it, and they would approach you now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Back then. The band, yeah. 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 I got long hair and you're i'll tell you the other thing is funny is i used to go visit my mom up in tahoe in lake tahoe and i would have like hair down to my it's longer than it is right now right <laughs> and like i would have girls up there because everybody it's a vacation spot right so the girls would go are you in a band 
Yeah. <laughs> and so, and it worked. It was, that was my game, right? At that point. So I was at a point where I was like, I'm just going to enjoy myself doing what I'm doing. I'm not looking for a girlfriend. I'm not looking to, you know, find a wife or anything like that. And I also like, I think a lot of guys who don't get laid very often tend to put like over overly put too much meaning on sex. Like I'm, I understand that like, you know, like sex between two people that are in love with each other. That's a different quality than like, than just having a mm-hmm. one night stand. I get that. But I always laugh when guys like say, Oh, you guys, you just get a, you're just measuring your dick or it's like a, your notch count is as a measurement of your manhood or your esteem or whatever. And it's like, or validation. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's never been my motive. It's like, she looks hot. I really want to get with that, right? Yeah. That's That was pretty much the as far as my thinking went. And it wasn't like, oh, I want to have her as arm candy. I want to walk down the street with this girl so guys will think I'm better than them. No, that's that's like blue pill beta male thinking. I just wanted a hot piece of ass. And so but pretty much everybody that I was in the, the scene with at that time, they wanted the same thing too. Yeah. So it wasn't anything more deep or meaningful or whatever, you know, than just like the fact that she was hot and I want to get it with it, right? So I learned that because that's when I was going through that fa- phase of life really where I was, um, I just wanted to sort of sample the goods for a long time. And like I, my, my notch count is public, public record. It's like 41, 42, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and most of that happened between the time I was about 21 till I was about 27. And that was, uh, those, those were interesting times, you know, to say, to say the least, but I found that like the more I focused on myself and the more that like, I like prioritize my, my pleasure or my intent or my will or whatever you want to call it. You can, you can, you can, there's lots of ways that, that people can enforce their will upon the world, whether that's through like fucking or the, or it's through money or it's through, you know, you can do it positively or mm-hmm. you can do it negatively, obviously. But, um, but at that point, I realized, I think I was just beginning to realize mental point of origin at that point. Mm-hmm. So you want to know where all this stuff comes from. Well, that was sort of like the, the germ of the idea, I think, back then. So when I got to the stage where I could go out and I could go play a gig and I could regularly go and say, okay, I want to get with that girl. I want to get with that girl. Um, then it becomes, um, okay, I want to get with uh, a black girl. Mm-hmm. I want to get with uh, a Vietnamese girl which I did. Um, I wanted to get with uh, a brunette, a blonde, what, you know, whatever it's like. You're trying, exactly. And I'll tell you what's funny is like there, there came a time where it's like, I finally got with a girl who's like a legitimate, you know, bonafide like swimsuit model. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh man, this is awesome. Like, I got with uh, what's next. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like, you're trying to escalate up to what's, what's the next experience I got with. I had, I think I had like three or four strippers that were in the, in that ranks. And, uh, and again, this is like when you say it, when guys say this, if they think it's a flex, I'm just saying yeah, that yeah, that's just, just what, what, yeah. what came in here, right? I'm not saying one's better than the other or not. I'm just saying that that's how it is. You can't, like most guys can't even talk about their sexual past without it seeming like a flex to mm-hmm. other guys, yeah. right? Um, and then when I say, oh, I've got a 40 notch count, right? Then guys, there are certain guys will go, you're a man whore, you know? Mm-hmm. You're like, especially if I'm talking to conservative That's low conservative considered to some people. And then I go and I talk to guys who are in the triple digits and they yeah. go, oh, man, those are rookie numbers, man. You yeah, gotta yeah. Pump those numbers up, right? And so I, uh, I went from, from not thinking about myself first to thinking about myself and suddenly my life started changing and there's things started working out a little bit different. And then I met the BPD girlfriend that I got with, and that's that was definitely a life lesson. That taught you something. And so I went from being sort of this freewheeling kind of alpha male guy, just by default. It's not like I go, I bet I think I need to alpha up. It wasn't a dis- conscious decision. It was just like this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it. Right. Then I meet her, and uh, I didn't meet her at a club. I met her in college, right, at a, at a community college I was going to. And I met her in a bookstore, which is where everybody tells you to find the one, right? You're yep. supposed to go to Bible study or, church, or the bookstore yeah, library. or well, yeah, Barnes and Noble. You'll find your you girl. You lean over her shoulder. That's a great read. It's like, right horse, there. don't go to the bookstore. <laughs> you well, know? no, it's like if she's busy reading, you know, instead of like actively yeah. hoeing, like yeah. her hobby is not seeking validation. Yeah. And I was on my game too back then too because I was full of myself. I was cocky as a motherfucker mm-hmm. back then because I had I had options. I seen pictures of you if back things, then. Yeah. yeah. If things didn't you work. You looked like a cocky fuck. If things didn't work out. <laughs> you did. If things didn't work out. I was like, oh, you know, there's other girls that want to, play. and even if I didn't have any girls on speed dial or whatever, I could call. I had fuck buddies at the time. I, yeah. I you know, if it wasn't this Friday, it was going to be the next Friday's mm-hmm. gig, right? And you was in love with this girl. So yeah, and that's the problem. It's like she t- she checked off all the boxes, but she was very much like um, 
mentally unstable. Yeah. Uh, she was crazy in bed and crazy out of bed. And she was the first time I, I didn't realize till later, like when I started studying psychology that she had borderline personality disorder still does to this day. And she was just, she was, she seemed very sincere. She was good looking. She had like checked off all the physical stuff, you know, stuff that I liked. She was like really good in bed and she, and the, but like, then the jealousy happens and then the fucking like, hey, don't leave me. And then like the claw marks in your freaking forearm it tap pushes and, you away. Yeah. And, and then it's just this back and forth and you get caught up in, in, in the whole borderline personality disorder. And you're trying to solve her problems and like her pro you are her problem. And if you could solve your, you, if you could solve the problem of you, then she would be, you would have this ideal relationship. And women with borderline personality disorder. I, this is actually just from experience. I don't even know as much as you. I just knew one who I was semi close with mm -hmm. extraordinarily seductive mm -hmm. and there seems and this is just my assessment i don't know as much as you it works there, better for women than it does men do yeah, get yeah there seems there comes a point w with sexual strategy like overwhelmingly seductive kind of shows you like everything that you love maybe everything that you love in yourself everything mm -hmm. that you love in her like a reflection like a mirror but there comes a point where like when they can drop their defenses and and let the the mental illness like out a little bit mm -hmm. more um, and then from that point on, uh, the girl that, that, uh, that I knew, the only girl I knew that had BPD, um, periodic, just periodically, kind of like a clock, beat herself up. Yeah, yeah. Or there was, it was always, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a set of personality traits or there's a set of like diagnosis for B BPD. I'll tell you what was crazy. It's like when I was studying borderline personality disorder, uh, I was in college. I was already married. I had a kid already, and I was already at UNR, and I was studying psychology, and I come across BPD in the DSM. Mm, the and you were intrigued. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Yeah. And I was looking at this, and go, holy shit. And I, I, and I looked it up. I said, is this really a, a cluster B and all that kind of stuff? Is this really what it is? And I'm like, oh, my God. And I, then I realized that the, the I didn't realize the bullet I dodged until I read that in the DSM, and I was like, oh, my God. It's sort of, you know, Put, put the end of the you know, the period on the end of that sentence but i was a different person then so you want to know about like blue pill beta moments dude i was below that i was like <clears throat> borderline omega you know i was just mm. like you would not want to have known me when i was at that point in fact a lot of people didn't that's the problem with with getting with a woman like that did it's you like, want did you want to do whatever made her happy did you immediately mm -hmm. apologize when she was upset how mm -hmm. can i make this mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. um things that were clearly not your yeah, fault maybe not you... in those words but yes what was her of... at home like situation like she uh well she was an only child um her uh her father was uh she always says abusive or whatever. But her father and her mother split. Her mom's just as whack too. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so she was she was very uh, attached and, and 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 sort of attached at the hip to mommy. And so she would be at the dorms at like the college she was going to, and then she would go back home and live literally live in the bedroom she'd been in since she was a kid. Yeah. Right. And um, and still trying to live an adult lifestyle where we're still fucking on the weekends or like mm -hmm. wherever I'm at kind of thing. And uh, it just got to the point where uh, I just couldn't take the like <laughs> the good sex was overpowered, vastly overpowered by all the head games and all the shit I had to take. And then yeah. she started cheating on me. So mm -hmm. on top of all of that, and I didn't want to believe that she was right. And so you get into that situation where you think that, well, the reason she's cheating on me is because I fucked up somehow. It's my fault that she's cheating on me. Mm -hmm. Right. And this isn't big, this is remember this is long before the internet this is long before Twitter where women are going you know if she cheated on you then it's your fault you didn't man up and well, that's lay probably, the dick that's probably how she rationalized it most likely there was something yeah. she wasn't getting from most you most likely justifies yeah. it yeah and so I was at a point where like my family didn't want to talk to me and I was isolated I was isolated mm. from my family of friends I didn't have very many I used to I went from having like all kinds of friends in the music industry uh, to like none. I had maybe two guys that I could talk to that were still like, when is this guy going to ever get a, get yeah. away from this bitch kind of thing? I and, had a couple friends like that. Yeah. Isolated but girl. like, my, I'm, I'm serious, like my brother, my family, my father, uh, they were like, they didn't want to talk to me because they just basically give up on you. And you don't realize how isolated you are because all you're thinking about is how am I going to make this bitch happy 24-7? Mm -hmm. You wake up in the morning and that's what you think, right? And... So you want to talk about, well, when, when was Rolo Beta? Well, I was worse at that point. So I'd gone from being sort of like this beta blue pill kid in high school to breaking up with that show who cheated on me, <laughs> breaking up with her, uh, going into the uh, Hollywood metal scene at that time and just sort of being like, you know, alpha male guy <clears throat> by default, right? And then 
getting with this girl who I thought checked off all the boxes, who I thought was going to be someone who's got like, oh, well, I could stick with this one kind of thing, but I had not killed the beta. And you want to know where that chapter in the book comes from. It's really that part right there. It's like mm. most guys cannot kill the beta. And so they'll, they will act cocky and funny or they'll learn game and they'll learn how to, how to get with women. But then they're using that game to get what they think is like what their blue pill ideals have told them that will make them whole or make them satisfied yeah. or make them like you'll have a better relationship you'll have a better relationship with your family or everything else will come into focus you can have great sex and you can have babies and you're going to go off into perpetuity with this girl because um you know you had enough game to get her but then they're not authentic once they get the girl and it blows up in their so face. they don't know it's how to like, maintain her yeah. they can dream get her girl, but they can't dream maintain girls and children with dynamite is what it is 